Okay, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today for part two of New World, India in a Rapidly Changing Climate, a three-part digital series to discuss resilience and recovery in the face of our two planetary challenges, COVID and climate change. My name is Shloka Nath and I'm the Executive Director of the India Climate Collaborative. The ICC, as we refer to it, is India's first ever collective response by business and philanthropy to enable climate action. Jawaharlal Nehru once said, crisis and deadlocks when they occur have at least this advantage that they force us to think. Is this the case for how we drive India's development forward? Are we as a country prepared to make structural shifts in how we recover? Or are we going to lock ourselves into a risky development pathway? There is a strong belief amongst the core constituency of India that the only way to truly recover from this crisis in the mid to long term is to overlay sustainable, affordable, inclusive, and just reforms onto any stimulus package. Others feel that the cost on lives and livelihoods means that anything goes if it means restarting economic activity again. Any green pathway India chooses must go hand in hand with job creation and a strong and swift economic recovery. So this evening, the task before us is exactly this. We discuss how India can re-emerge green into this post-COVID world because the economic recovery plans that nations like India are now making may offer the best chance we'll ever get at deep changes to pause the jaggedly rising curves of our planetary fever. We're privileged to have an incredible panel with us once again, and I'd like to welcome Nader Godridge, Managing Director, Godridge Industries and Chairman, Godridge Agrovet, Vikram Singh Mehta, Chairman and Senior Fellow, Brookings India and former CEO, Shell India, and Janma Jai Sinha, Chairman, Boston Consulting Group India. Our moderator tonight is no less a luminary. Sunita Narain is a Padma Shri recipient and the Director General for the Center for Envi Science and Environment, as well as the editor of the fortnightly magazine, Down to Earth. Sunita is a writer and an environmentalist and a major proponent of the green concept of sustainable development. A few housekeeping rules before I hand over. Your audio and videos have been disabled, but please feel free to share your questions in the Q&A. The ICC team will compile and will share them with the panel. We, ha we have about a 35 minute discussion with the panelists, after which we will switch to the Q&A. And I will take a few questions initially for Sunita since we don't wanna miss the opportunity to have her thoughts as well. And then I'll hand it back to Sunita to ask the panelists the other questions. So with that, Sunita, over to you and I'll be back soon. Thank you, Shloka and uh, welcome everybody. This is really a privilege. I think it's a very, very difficult time and um, um, it's a time also for very serious conversations because I don't think we in this generation, my generation, and I'm old, uh, we have ever seen this kind of disruption in our lives. We have not seen the World War II. We have never seen this kind of disruption. We have never seen this kind of tragedy. We have never seen this kind of loss of livelihoods and the shutting down of economies. The images of migrants walking miles, being killed because of traffic accidents, too tired, and so they sleep on railway tracks. I know this has shaken the consciousness, the conscience of the entire nation. There is no way we can be inured or immune to this. This is absolutely heartbreaking. And this is really where we as environmentalists cannot even celebrate the clean air that we have in our cities today. The fact of the matter is our air is clean. I mean, for, for someone like me who has been doing everything and fighting with just about every kind of interest to try and push for policies and practices so that we can get rid of dirty um, uh, fuel and that we can get uh, better transportation policies. The fact is the lockdown has come at, you know, it, it, has, been, it has been incredible. But that also tells us that the, the, the nature of pollution is such and the scale of pollution is such that it takes as much as a lockdown. The shutting down completely of all economic activity of all vehicles on our roads and at huge cost. So it's not acceptable. But this then brings us to this very serious conversation of today. And I'm really privileged that I have with me three 
extremely knowledgeable people, people in their own fields who know what is happening, have the pulse of their own area of work to share with us what then can be the world post lockdown. The fact is we have had clean air, we have had the benefits of a clean environment, but at a cost that we cannot take. But the question today is, as the lockdown opens, as India goes back to the new normal, can we reimagine, redefine that new normal so that we can have growth, but without pollution, so that we can have growth, which is inclusive and affordable, which can meet the needs of the poorest. And I think that's really where I can see the conversation beginning to happen in the country. We've seen some very interesting announcements from the finance minister over the past two days, which will help us to think about a reimagining of, of local economies. So I think that's really where I want to place this discussion. And I want to start off with Mr. Godrich. Mr. Godrich has, has penned down a very, you know, a, a touching poem, something that when I read, it, 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 it makes you feel, it makes you understand the scale of the pain, but also the opportunity. And I would like to request him to read out that poem. I, uh, the poem is also going to be available on social media, so you'll be able to read it um, and post that. Once he's read it, I'm going to ask him some rather tough questions on some of the things he said in his poem. And then of course, take it to the other panelists. Uh, so Mr. Godrich, please. Thank you, Sunita. The coronavirus strikes us all. We don't know who is next to fall. When will this war be finally won? While lockdowns help, they are no fun. And yet, our air is very clean. We see the benefits of going green. In this darker star, there is some light. And now we have a clear sight of what a different world might be. And yet, that false dichotomy between growth and being green, unfortunately, is often seen. But I, for one, am always loath to see either or, for I want both. It was no longer climate change within a tolerable range, but a climate emergency is what we now clearly see. A crisis is what it's about, with fires, floods, as well as drought. And even though the lockdown's brief, it has brought us so much relief Everywhere the air is clean, we see the benefits of being green. It only serves to prove the point that everything was out of joint. If we must, we will adapt. Prevention, though, would be more apt. There is a cost to adaptation. It's rising fast in every nation, as well as for the world at large. This will be a heavy charge. In fact, we should all conclude Prevention would be far more shrewd. A uniform carbon tax would protect all our banks, collected by each nation state, but universal in its rate. But $60 per metric ton would surely get reduction done. Based on today's emissions rate, quite candidly, I should state, it wouldn't be a trivial sum. But there's no reason to be glum. In dollars, it would be two trillion. It is a lot, but not a zillion. But bear in mind, it's not a cost. For the economy, nothing's lost. A UBI could be instated. Some other tax could be abated. And if this is indeed just so, the economy would still grow. Don't you think it's very nice that we don't have to pay a price? and very little would be lost as adaptation has a higher cost. In the Goatridge group, it is seen that our goals of good and green, though ambitious, will be done. Sustainability can be won. And so without partiality, our goal for all is neutrality, whether water, carbon, or solid waste. By 2020, we will make haste to make our net emissions zero. Will that make the group a hero? In 2010, the goal looked tall, but we took a reason call. Technology would save the day. So far, it has turned out 
that way. As technology takes a leap, green energy gets very cheap. At first, we thought we'd have to spend, but that's not true, for in the end, the more we thought, the more we slaved, we did invest, but we also saved. And solar will hit the goal of being cheaper than even coal in just a handful of years. Already, we and our peers are sourcing solar electricity at lower rates than the utility. For quite some time, we've been extorted and their finances still aren't sorted. A silver lining can be seen since it incentivizes green. There are many parts that we can see for achieving carbon neutrality, but the cheapest way is certainly through energy efficiency. Real interest rates are rather low and high returns quickly flow from any energy saving device. For business, this is very nice. Not only are returns quite brisk, there's also very little risk. In India, mandated CSR can help us go very far. Multiple benefits is what one sees with water projects or growing trees. Good livelihoods are created. Our carbon emissions are abated. Trees planted at a river source maintain the flow throughout its course. So many benefits we can see. The preservation of biodiversity. Different species can be tried. Useful products can be supplied like biomass or edible fruits. And yet the trunk and the roots can sequester carbon, clean the air, a win-win that is very fair. So while we decarbonize, why not also monetize? So never fall for either or. Our hearts and minds demand much more. The case, of course, is very clear. And yet we are nowhere near any kind of firm solution to end greenhouse gas pollution. Around the world, we would find so many leaders that are blind or perhaps not so benighted, but conveniently short-sighted. Why undergo any pain if by the time you get the gain, you will no longer be around? To politicals, this may seem sound. Prevention is much better than cure. So learn it now or then endure the endless pain and aggravation of the heavy cost of adaptation. This is the time we should take heed. With appropriate change, we can succeed. Our economy, we can renew while giving nature her rightful due. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodrich. I think everyone will agree who's hearing this, not just the words, but your voice, the passion uh, in your voice, I think is so important and so touching for all of us and so correct at this moment. So my question really for you will be, before I move to the other panelists, will be, you know, you have really touched on some very, very key ideas, the carbon tax, the issue of energy efficiency, the fact that it's good for business, the fact that leaders are so short-sighted that they don't see, even in the age of corona, and COVID-19, they don't see the benefit of prevention over treatment. So how, and you work with the business community, you're part of that. How do you see some of these ideas taking root, particularly the issue of carbon tax? How do you see that happening? Mr. Gordon? Uh, yes, uh, Sunita, uh, I'm on the executive council of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. This is a group of global companies that are looking at how we can get this happen. And one of the things we can do is advocacy and we can advocate for a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. The trouble with the carbon tax is if some people pay the tax and others are not uh, paying, it's unfair competition. So we need a global carbon tax and we need uh, taxation in trade if somebody is not applying the carbon tax so that there is no... Uh, the ability to compete is still there. Yeah. So through advocacy, if we have a carbon tax, and I mentioned $60, but I think there will be a lot of benefits even from $30 or $40. Mm -hmm. This carbon tax, if it is uniformly as I explained, and some other taxes were abated, 
uh, it wouldn't really be a cost to the economy. Anyway, it is only about 3% of the global economy and only 10% of total taxation. So it's very easy to rebate some other tax and solve the problem. But it needs collective action. No, good point. And I mean, given the complexity of climate change, where you have such inequities between countries, this is an issue that really needs to be discussed. How do you provide a level playing field in such an inequitable world? But very important points. Let me take this directly to Mr. Mehta. Um, Vikram, the big issue really um, today is energy. And I mean, energy and climate change is really the biggest question. The question really is the reinvention post lockdown in the post COVID world. But this is a time when, you know, when Mr. Goodrich talks and very, I mean, rightly so, emphasizes the need for a carbon tax, emphasizes the need for much more uh, work on solar or energy efficiency. But this is also the time, and you know this more than anyone else, when the oil prices are at such low levels. And given that, how do you actually make sure that oil at such low levels does not outcompete every other source of clean energy? And that governments don't then in their rush to, to grow, again say, you know, all these ideas are great, but right now we need brown energy. Vikram? Um, sorry, Sunita, I missed the last two words, but I think I got the, the yeah. general gist of what you were saying. Uh, firstly, let me just uh, start by complimenting another on, on, on an evocative, powerful, passionate uh, rendition uh, of a problem that uh, I think concerns all of us. And uh, the answer to your question has to be in three parts. The first is, yes, the price of oil has collapsed, and to that extent, it has imposed some competitive pressures on substitute uh, uh, clean energy options. But that is, I think, a very short-term way of looking at it. The uh -huh. second part of the answer has to be that, look, irrespective of what uh, is the price of fossil fuels, COVID has clearly thrown a cannery in the coal mine for climate change. It has brought into sharp relief the inadequacy of the market and the importance of uh, collective action and, and state capacity. And we now need to ask some fundamental questions, we meaning the government and all the stakeholders. What, what steps must the government take to ensure that the post-COVID recovery is robust, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable? Um, the third part, of course, of the answer has to be that we not, you have to recognize the hard truth. The hard truth is that 76% of our energy consumption is still accounted for by coal, oil, and gas. And to that extent, it's going to be very difficult for us to transit towards a clean energy system in the short to medium term. Even if the price of oil, gas, and coal were uncompetitive against the alternative. The reason is that the energy infrastructure is built to sustain a fossil fuel energy system. Our, our industry, our economy is built on a fossil fuel energy system. So we need to actually address the, the, the questions that you've raised uh, in these three parts. And my answer to your specific question of how do we actually ensure that we don't steer away from the clean energy path mm -hmm. is very clear. We have to first look at those options, those policy options that can be delivered in the short term. For example, we need to invest in greening fossil fuels. Coal gasification is a known technology. We have to make sure that coal gasification technology is brought into the country and applied across all, all possible coal options. Then we need to also ask the, ask the second question is, what do we do about the power sector? We need, the fact, the fact is that 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions are accounted for by the energy sector. Mm. And within that, 77% is accounted for by electricity. 
So unless we actually address the issue of overhauling the power sector, we're not going to weaken the link between economic growth, energy demand, and the environment. So the very important second order solution has to be to completely overhaul the power sector. The third issue, which is again something we can do in the short term, is that we need to... Sorry, Mr. Mehta, we've lost you. We seem to have lost your audio, Mr. Mr. Mehta. All distortionary Hello. Hello. It's better now. Can you, can, you, can you repeat the third point again? Sorry, I'll, I'll be very brief. Then Th the third point was to do with subsidies. The okay. the we need to eliminate distortionary subsidies. The twenty billion dollars of subsidies to the power sector and to oil, gas, and coal. Twelve billion to oil, gas, and coal, and eight billion or thereabouts to power. We act, these are distortionary subsidies. We need to redirect those subsidies towards one direct transfer of cash to those who are who need to actually who need the subsidies and more important we need to direct this money to the renewable energy sector in part to finance the high capital upfront capital costs of renewables and in part to actually incentivize the uh, innovation for renewable energy Excellent. There, I have two other. I have two other uh, solutions, but I'll pause here because otherwise I'll. Yeah. I'll, take a I'll come back to you because I think energy is something that uh, all panelists uh, would uh, can comment on, and I think you've set out a very very important agenda, Mr. Sinai. If I could draw you into this um, issue, I mean, I think um, I know you very strongly believe in the whole issue of growth and sustainability, but how do you see that happening? particularly when it comes to jobs, because one of the big issues that has come out today is the whole migrant issue actually hides behind it. The fact that the global and the economic model that we have today and the whole world has today discounts environment and discounts the cost of labor, which is why industrialization has happened without paying the real cost of labor, which is housing, health care, all the rest of it. And today, the exodus that you're seeing today is because people don't have the wherewithal to be able to survive. So given this, and given both the exodus to rural areas, but also given the need to reinvent both environment and labor um, conditions for a different global economic model, how would you weigh into this? So uh, let me uh, just divide this into two parts. The first is that you know, back in 1965, Mansur Olson had talked about the collective action problem, where he had said that where there are concentrated benefits and diffuse costs, you have the free rider problem, that the diffuse costs, you know, because it's a public good, if things get worked out, you benefit. If they don't, you have a small cost. And the people who benefit, benefit big. But there is hope today. And there is really something which is, which is quite useful and it might actually work out. There are four things which provide hope. First is trial. This awful two months has actually given a lot of people uh, uh, a recollection and a memory uh, for some who are old like me and for the youngsters, the first exposure to clean air, which they didn't have. So that's great. They've had exposure. They've had trial. And then there are three things that can actually allow us to overcome the political problem where you have a short-term outcome need and so you can't move, which are, first, the world we will go back to is not the world we left. Let us have no doubt about that. The world we will go back to will be, in a sense, a much more Cold War kind of a situation where two superpowers. So if India wants to take advantage of that in manufacturing, currently the cost of capital, the cost of power makes it completely uh, uncompetitive. 
And if it is to do something about power cost, it really needs to look at power policy. And Vikram knows this much better than I do, but let's face it, you cannot subsidize your way out of it. And even the politics of this is not becoming that effective anymore because anecdotally you see that villagers cut the power line that is giving them power because they just can't deal with this, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the volatility around it and the unpredictability about it. And so they are willing to pay 18 rupees to get some private power. So then you have an option to actually create substations which can actually pull in renewals. The second two, which give us a lot of hope are the combination of, you know, World War II brought women into the workforce mm. because so many men died. You know, 9-11 brought the security industry into the focus. You know, SARS brought e-commerce in, you know, and this time around, attitudinal changes, you know, have one of the attitudinal changes may be a demand by the public for better air. Second is digital allows you that because if we really talk about jobs, where is the problem in clean jobs? The biggest areas for India are health and education. And we don't use digital in health and education. So Chandra, who's written a great book called Digital, where he says, use semi-skilled people powered by technology to deal with these things in a new paradigm. Our healthcare system is falling apart. We could be the, the first world, you know, the, the rocket world of healthcare because of our constraints if we actually change the paradigm. And we could change the paradigm in education and in healthcare, which will provide massive jobs. And it can be done with semi skilled people. And it can actually unlock a lot of what India needs. So I, why am I hopeful? I am hopeful because people have experienced fresh air. Mm. They've experienced the sky. I am hopeful because attitudinal changes can last longer. I am hopeful because digital is allowing us the ability to do this. And if we can, un, you know, if we can abolish the APMC, which touches agriculture and all the vested interests there, then I am sure the discounts are a lesser problem than the APMC. So the, you know, the hope then is there. Of course, in India, you know, but now that uh, Nadir has set up this poetic thing, you know, between the conception and the creation often falls the shadow here and we just need to keep the shadow apart. You know, I mean, that's what we need to fight on. But very wise words, very wise words from all three of you. And I, I, before I open um, to questions, let me take the energy question back to all of you, because I think that's a key one for the future. And, uh, and Vikram has touched on it. You have touched on it. So has Mr. Gotrich touched on it. And let me get back to each one of you to ask this really tough question that on one hand, we do need cheap energy if we want to compete. And on the other hand, we need clean energy. And you're so right to say we've, we've tasted clean air this time and we don't want to lose it. So how do we make sure that both those are, you know, those two um, uh, can be balanced out? And to this, let me sort of, you know, also ask, um, and Vikram, I'll start with you on this. I mean, the finance minister today has actually um, I mean, she's come up with a slew of reforms and um, obviously some will be, some will hurt, uh, some will be more important for us, less, but that's not the point. The point is to look at the issue of coal. Coal is the bugbear when it comes to climate change. It's really at the, at the leading cause of local air pollution. We know today that almost 40 to 50% of the pollution in our cities is coming from the use of coal in industries, okay? Not just in thermal power plants. So, it, and coal price is eight rupees as compared to natural gas, which is over 40 rupees and renewable with the capital cost not paid as subsidy, um, even then uh, is not able to compete. So how do you, all three of you, and I want to bring all of you into this because this is the core of our debate. How do you see, what is the policy that 
we should be pushing for that we can get both uh, cleaner coal, but also uh, clean energy to survive. Vikram, can I ask you? Yes. Uh, firstly, I think the trade-off between uh, renewables and fossil fuels has actually narrowed considerably because of technology. The cost of renewables has fallen significantly and under certain sort of conditions, solar and solar in particular is now competitive against certainly imported coal and even domestic coal, which is, which is to be transported a thousand kilometers from the pithead. Just, so just to make sure that we understand mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it isn't as if renewables is uncompetitive. Today, the price of solar is now has come down sharply and the challenge for us is not so much the cost of renewables is the infrastructure that allows us to scale up renewables so as to substitute the fossil fuels mm -hmm. so that's just a just a start point mm -hmm. i think the finance minister's uh, statement which i haven't read but you've summarized is about to our reality the point that i made earlier that 76 percent of our energy system is still dependent on fossil fuels. And of that 76, 45, 48, 6 percent is coal. And we're not going to be able to shift away from that in part because of economics and in part because of the infrastructure. But having said that, the finance minister, I hope, is also going to introduce into any policy to do with fossil fuels, into any policy to do with two elements. One is the energy must not be looked at through the siloed compartmentalized sort of processes that we have today. Uh, there's a Ministry of Coal, there's a Ministry of Power, there's a Ministry of Petroleum. There are five different cabinet ministers actually addressing energy. I think we've lost Vikram again, Shloka. And there is therefore no. Have I? Have you lost me again? Yeah, your yes, Wi-Fi. Briefly, briefly. So you were making the point in terms of just if you can keep it short because I want the other panelists to weigh in on this as well. I think the point that you were making was very good. That you know, okay, yes, coal, but the policy package has to recognize that we need to have a different pathway. That's the point that you were. So making. that's the. So just to I'll skip the point about the institutional sort of systems, the creation of a holistic energy decision making structure. But let me just say that the policy pathway should actually be based on a green recovery plan, energy plan, which incorporates within that plan certain basic principles. One is that there should be no, there should be direct transfer of subsidies. There should two is that. We must price in the externality, the, the cost of the externality. Third principle is that we must invest in green technology. And finally, uh, of not finally, fourth is that we should maybe change the accounting system. Today, financial accounting's, accounting is mark to market. Perhaps we should actually read, devise or devise a new system which uh, which talks about mark to environment and corporates need to actually focus perhaps on understanding that new accounting system. And finally, we should have a collaborative approach to energy. Good. Very good. Mr. Godrich, how would you see this happening in the real world? In the world of industry, which is now going to want to ramp up production as fast as possible. They don't want to look back. They've had two crippling months. Labor has run away. They want action today. Do you think these are just big words that we can just talk about or can we actually make this happen in our world? You are on Mr. mute, Nadir. You are on mute. I agree entirely with Vikram. We need uh, major reforms. But just from the perspective of business, I want to say a few things. Yes. All, uh, electricity from coal is cheap. We actually pay our utility <laughs> seven to eight rupees. And in many of our factories, we are using biomass to generate electricity as well as steam. We need both steam and electricity. 
And even at a very small scale, this is much more economical than what we pay the utility. Mm. Uh, in some of our factories, we use our own byproduct biomass. In other factories, we actually source biomass. Mm. The good thing about biomass is it's not time-based like wind or solar. You can use biomass 24 by 7. And we have a lot of continuous factories. Now, the total availability of biomass is low. But I think it's quite economical to grow bamboo or trees for biomass. So they will be sequestering carbon and part of it you will harvest as biomass. This would be a very viable solution. But we, the simplest reform we need is the ability to buy green energy and wheel it at a, as a, at a reasonable cost. On paper, these systems are there, but utilities, because they lose their own business, frown upon it very often and put a stop to it. Fascinating. No, I really love your point on biomass. In fact, uh, Mr. Godrej, this is such a win-win because, you know, you have this whole burning of biomass that is happening all over North India, adding to pollution in winter. And we have been looking and we have actually found lots of industries, large industries, now switching to using biomass as a fuel. And that's a real win-win. Both the farmers get paid, there's a value for the crop, uh, for their residue, and we have less pollution. So I, I really love these ideas that we could pursue. Mr. Sinha, would you like to weigh into some of this? Because we're really getting a good list of some, ex, you know, very good ideas for the future. Look, you know, if you look at it, India has 400 gigawatt of, of power. 120 mm -hmm. gigawatt is renewable. And that 120, we use 20, 25 percent of that. This is a policy choice which we have messed up with, right? I mean, if we were even using 120, then we are already looking at this. We are, our last mile is poor. So can we create a franchisee model, you know, where we actually work with the disco and actually do their collections for them in the villages and have the power, you know, to have substations being supported by renewables and actually pulling in from the grid and then doing the billing and, and, and getting some of that stuff in. The level of cross subsidy in India is amazing. I mean, so we we deliberately make our industry uncompetitive on power because we subsidize so poorly, and that's very bad for water, which is also an environmental concern which we are completely neglecting. And and so some of these are really serious issues, which are now coming to the fore. And you know, I feel that. The timing is right, actually. You know, I mean, if this crisis has come, it has given us the ability to think about some of these big policies again. And our fight, you know, I have to just put one thing, which Vikram, again, you know this better. But oil prices being low is not such a big deal. It is coal, which is our big problem. You know, yes. we have to attack coal, not, I mean, oil is okay, but coal is our problem right now. And thermal power is where we, we run into all the, uh, all the greenhouse gas problems. No, I think very interesting ideas. And I think given the 90,000 crore that is going to be put into the discoms, I think this is the op opportunity we have to actually think about a different kind of reform, not more money down bad. So I think these are some very interesting ideas for the moment. Shloka, can I now turn to you? You had questions for us? Yes. I have questions for you, Sunita, and then I'm going to hand it back to you to ask the, the panel questions. We have over 50 uh, questions from the audience already so we could we could go all night um, but I'm going to just I'm going to club three questions for you really quickly Sunita um, the first is from Nikhil Kumar who's asked will the remedies to climate change be worse than the disease will it drive more people into poverty with higher costs the second question for you is from Vijeta Ratani and this is actually a question I think the whole panel can address but it's how do you view the current announcements made by the FM in the context of reimagining local economies and making it more resilient and sustainable? And the final question for you is that the Indian government has reiterated that it will deliver on its global climate commitments under the Paris Agreement, but is also currently easing environmental clearances for industry. Does this send mixed messages? How should the Indian government balance the urgency of current recovery with the need to prevent future climate impacts? So with that, so Sunita, yeah. back to you, and then Thank you can you. ask the rest of the panelists all yeah. of the other questions. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, I think, you know, the first question I really want to say 
one of the most important questions because in the time of COVID, one of the things that we have all understood is that we had to shut down the economy because we had to protect our health. And we knew that a country like India, if the contagion had spread, we could not fight this battle in hospitals. We do not have the wherewithal in our hospitals. We understood that. But the fact also matter is that the lockdown has led to huge pain. And it has definitely led to distress of the very poor in our country. And there is no, and let's be clear about this. Let's not sort of paper this fact over. This is really bad. Now, this is where we need to be clear that we must not do climate policies like this. And we could do it differently. I mean, the fact of the matter is, even when it came to COVID-19, we could have thought about the fact that you would have vast numbers of labor. And therefore, what could you do to provide for them? You could provide more money and sustenance in their hands. You could think, as the finance minister very rightly yesterday has talked about a more resilient local economy, rural economy, so that people don't have to leave. I mean, the fact of the matter is that you've had in Maharashtra, you have the beginning of the employment guarantee scheme way back in 1972, at a time of a famine, same as the situation today. And Maharashtra came up with a scheme which was a compact between the rural and the urban. It was not about employment. It was about the urban professional paying a cost, a tax, to keep the poor employed where they lived. Now, it's another matter that that scheme became one of breaking stones, that the assets were never built. But that's really where the opportunity comes. So I don't for once believe that we have to have a climate policy which will bring more pain and more grief. You've heard it from the panel today. There are options that are that are available to reinvent the energy system. We need affordable energy. We need inclusive energy. We need everybody to have a light bulb. Now, that can happen, but we need to think about the policy, which is first good for people and the poor, and then good for climate. And I think that's the order of thinking that we need to come up with. So I hope that gives you an answer. The second question from Vijeta, who is a former colleague, in fact, um, I will ask all uh, panelists uh, to comment on it. The, F the FM's um, uh, yesterday's announcement on a lot of reform that would happen in the agriculture rural areas. Do you see that adding up to building the, the change that we require for a resilient, for a climate resilient, uh, poverty resilient uh, rural economy. Um, um, Mr. Sinha, can I begin with you? Look, uh, the reforms have to be comprehensive. You know, so we need to just look at what all, I, I would like to wait through the full set of reforms. I think the reforms of MSME have been very good because they have actually really taken an out risk aversion and put about 3 trillion rupees, which can actually reach SME. But the SME will not use that capital unless you have aggregate demand. So my one fear right now is that aggregate demand, there's not been enough done to raise aggregate demand, which is really important. So I'm waiting to see what comes with that. But you know, one thing which is really good, and it's horrible to say it this way, but it's really good. The migrant labor going back to the village you know, is not just a failure of government. We corporates have to accept yes. our own responsibility. Yes, absolutely. Let us not run away from that. Absolutely. And this will also raise awareness for everyone that people take that much and then you can't go further than that. Yeah. So, you know, the 1991-92 reforms had brought in a lot of liberalization, but you know, the, the, the things about backward areas and building industry there, that had got a bit weakened. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, getting out of some of these ghetto type slums is only a, just a good, you know, and even if we were to build, con do construction there, that would create employment and we could do it better. And we could actually get new cities created, you know, where industries could come up. That would not be a bad thing, you know, I mean, and so this is a, a good wake up call. Absolutely. This is a good wake up call for everyone, not just for government. We should take responsibility too. 
No, very good. I let me take the last question to me very quickly because then I want to open there are a lot of questions to all of you. So we should I should do my task as a moderator and not uh, take up the space. So the question to me was about easing uh, regulations and yet wanting to meet the Paris commitments. Now I think you know that's a very serious question, and we are all of us are always concerned. I mean, all governments, and please be clear about this. And I, I've been, I'm too old in this. I have seen government after government, uh, environment minister after environment minister. And I can tell you all governments find it very difficult to balance the, the question of growth versus environment. And what we have done also over the last few years is to make environmental management so convoluted that it's actually become rather senseless in its application. And that's also why it's easy for many people not to stand behind and say, no, we don't want these conditions eased. We don't want EIA to be diluted because EIA actually as a tool has in many ways even lost its purpose. I mean, we had a major gas leak that happened just two weeks ago, 10 days ago. And the fact is that company did not have an environmental clearance. Why? Because you have created such a matrix and a framework of institutions which have to give different clearances that you, even industry, the best of them don't know how to survive in it. And most of them make use of the system to be able to find the loopholes around it. So I think it's important for us as environmentalists and for government to actually keep this in mind that we do want, and I think post COVID it's going to become even more urgent. It's going to become even more desperate because we have, as Mr. Sinha said, seen clean air, we don't want to lose it. So let me get to some of the questions now. I have for Vikram, um, I have a question from Bhaskar Veera. Today, the finance minister announced a package of 50,000 crore to build infrastructure for import transporting coal, transporting coal, while also ending the government monopoly in the coal sector. In what way is this compatible with the transition to a zero carbon future? Something along the lines I had asked you, Vikram, but a very sharp question. So would you like to take this? I've already answered, I guess. It's, it's about to the reality. Uh, Coal is a, a major part of our economy. It employs uh, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And today we are importing 24% of our coal requirements. Uh, so the current sort of decision is in part to improve the productivity of coal production and in part to ensure that coal reaches all corners of, of the economy. It is not prima facie compatible with our uh, move towards uh, uh, a zero carbon or a low carbon economic growth model, unless and until we are actually also focused on, on greening coal. As I said in my opening remark, we have to fund the gasification of coal. We have to fund technology that will be innovative and that will actually lead to the greening of our fossil fuels. Excellent. So, okay. I think very sharp, very good. Uh, Mr. Godrich, I have a question for you from Prashant Mahajan. Offsetting carbon should not absolve the industries of their primary responsibility of decarbonization in the manufacturing process and across the supply chain. Industries must have science-based targets for decarbonization. Your, um, your point on this? Uh it is very difficult to get to net zero without offsets. And offsets might be the cheapest solution. Perhaps the cheapest offset is growing trees and economically useful trees that can successfully decarbonize the whole economy. So I don't see why we shouldn't see that as an alternative. No, I think if I can just add on to that, um, uh, Prashant, I think it's a very important point that Mr. Godrich has made, the net zero, but, and this is where it also fits into the point of rural economy livelihoods, but this is where growing trees cannot become, uh, trees cannot be carbon sink itself. They have to be livelihood opportunities for poor people. 
They have to be given, the, it is the tribals who need to grow the trees and they need to be able to cut the trees and regrow the trees. So the model of tree growing has to be one which creates livelihood opportunity for the poorest, not a carbon sink for our waste. So I think that's where the win-win is possible. But again, it's about the direction of policy we take in it. Um, uh, Sunita, I'd like you to add one yes, other point. Uh, uh, it is possible for uh, fossil fuels to be net zero carbon sometimes. Uh, people have found that a little bit of carbon dioxide does some amount of enhanced oil recovery. But by adding much more carbon dioxide, you get a little bit more oil out. And, and, the, and uh, an oil field that does this might be net zero carbon. No, this is, I think that's where the technology development is going to happen. But with cheap oil, all this is going to be up in the air. Um, but enough. cheap oil, with the, you might need a slightly hard, hard, higher carbon tax. Yes, absolutely. And you could have net zero oil. Absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Sinha, question for you. What are the measures we can take towards localizing technologies which are required for us to go green? What are some challenges and what can we do to leverage the skill development mission for this? Excellent so, question. So, you know, I, I have to tell you that all these are connected. And if we talk about industry 4.0, it actually allows that, you know, I mean, I tell you, manufacturing will become local and services will become central because, I mean, you know, the, 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 the shift will happen. Service, uh, the servitization, as they call it, will, will become, uh, uh, you know, more knowledge intensive and distribution can become local because now you can have plants which are small, which are interchangeable, where you can stop and you can build, a, a, you know, the, from the same line, you can build scooters and uh, and washing machines. You know, I mean, and you can share them and you can have them local. There is a lot of possibility. Hmm. You know, Roy Amara had long ago said that the, the the technology. You know, you always overestimate its impact in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. We are actually in the long run now. We don't need to overestimate it. It's available. We need to push it. Um. Um. Vikram, there's a question for you uh, from Asta Sina. What is possibility of carbon sequestration in the Indian context? It's an economic issue. I mean, this is the point that uh, Nadir was just making, that mm. you, know, you are able to sequester the, the, the carbon dioxide, but it's a very expensive uh, proposition. And uh, I don't think that uh, the the economics will allow it, and and furthermore, the nature of our decision-making structure is such that it will also be an impediment. The reason I say that very briefly is that, of course, the uh, Ministry of Petroleum, which is a central body, uh, is the is is responsible for exploration and production, but all the other activities related to land has to be handled by the state, and all too often these the state and the center are not in harmony uh, uh, with regard to new initiatives. So uh, carbon sequestration is an idea. It's something that we should be talking about, but I don't see this as, a, as an answer to our, our uh, greenhouse gas sort of issue. I don't see that as an answer to greening fossil fuels in India. I have a number of questions on air pollution, so I'm going to take that to all the panelists, and I would also like to answer them. Um, I think one of the big issues that uh, people are asking is uh, low-hanging fruit that can be employed to reduce emissions. What are those from transport sector? In some places with notoriously high traffic, the most serious air pollution is from polluting vehicles. So what can be done? And I think this really, I'd like each one of us to weigh in because What's very clear with this lockdown is that vehicles are a major cause of the pollution. It was taking cars off the road, trucks off the road, which actually led to uh, less pollution. So now that we are going back to normal and I can see the cars coming back, the trucks coming back, what can we do? So uh, Mr. Godridge, Mr. Sinha, Vikram, and then I would also like to add on this. Uh, one thing we can do with vehicles is electrify them. 
The problem is that uh, electric vehicles have a very high cost. Uh, and if they're not utilized all the time, they're not economical. But an electric taxi is very economical. Mm. An electric truck is a challenge because you would need a huge battery. But what if you provided electricity on a highway and had a very small battery? That mm. might be a solution for rapid electrification. Mm. Mm. Mr. Sinha, you want to add to this? Look, Clean air there are, there, there are, uh, if we look at uh, PM 2.5, you know, in, in the cities, then there are four elements that we have studied. 40% of that is vehicle, about 20% is, you know, the burning in the, of the fields. Then there are industrial and construction dust. Now, if you look at uh, just now, we can do some simple things like we can do car for clunkers kind of program to get to BS6. I mean, that's just one of the simpler. That doesn't solve the problem, it, 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 it helps. Now, electrification makes the PM 2.5 go away, but if you're using coal, then the greenhouse gas problem doesn't go away with electrification of vehicles. So you need to just now, what have we done? Our meetings are happening on Zoom. So we need to reduce the amount of travel we do in cities which is now actually feasible. You know, there are things that we can do work from home. We can do meetings uh, with uh, differently. We don't need to fly that much. So some of that will also help. But of course, the, the issue is public transportation right now, people will be a bit fearful with the virus. We need to get, you know, some stuff on public transportation. Done. You know, there are a lot of small measures but then there are also some, some big measures and we need to also, you know, just have an integrated plan to make this work. And our pricing has to be different. We are not pricing correctly, you know I mean? And we need to recognize what we want to price for and how. Vikram, you want to add to this? I mean, cities are now going bicycling to uh, deal with uh, public transport challenges. Exactly, so, so I, I mean, I, all of what's been said is of course, yeah. uh, very relevant and what you've just added, public transportation, uh, redesigning of the urban space to allow for pedestrian highway, pedestrian and cycles. But may I come to a more fundamental issue, which I think is what bothers me all the time when we talk about changing uh, from where we are to somewhere else. And I've already addressed that earlier, but I need to reemphasize that today, any decision that is related to energy is taken by one silo department, which is not necessarily going to address the totality of the issue. So when we talk about transport, for example, and electrical vehicles, we are actually asking the Ministry of Heavy Industry, the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Petroleum to work together. It doesn't happen. There is no fora where they will sit together. When we talk about urban design, we're talking about the state government, the central government, and we are asking them to actually co uh, combine. So. I really think a very fundamental question here is how do we redesign the decision-making structure within the state government and the central government to ensure that clean energy uh, is uppermost, is a priority in the agenda of all levels of government. Mm -hmm. And that goes down to the level of local government and urban local government and the Panchayati Raj rural local government. That I think has got to be fundamental. Otherwise, all the issues that we're talking about get sort of lost or fall into the cracks between different government ministries. Um, and one last point I'd make, which is uh, uh, something I've, I've thought about only as a measure to mobilize public opinion in favor of, of a clean energy agenda. And that is that the government of India, the prime minister, uh, should actually bring this issue onto the legislative agenda and maybe pass a bill, something like the clean, uh, clean energy, uh, climate change and clean energy bill. And it's, it's a bill that announces to the world and to India that this issue of climate change is now fundamental to the sustainable development of our economy. It is not something that we can leave outside the framework of public attention. That's one of the most, I think we need to connect government policy to public uh, interest. 
Shoe Look, up, please tell me what to do. I mean, the questions are just coming and coming and coming, and they are brilliant questions. Each one of them is very, very important. I think you need to hold many such sessions and, and so that you can do justice to them. But we have run out of time. So would you like uh, to post these questions later on? And... Uh, um, and we wrap up now, should... Uh... Well, that would be great, Sunita. If you want to just sort of summarize and then hand it back to me to wrap up. We've had over 150 questions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. This is an incredibly engaging it's audience. It's fascinating. And, and I can discussion. just... See, and each question is fascinating. I think, I think what... I just want to wrap up to say that I hope you all have, have enjoyed this. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting issue. I think it's a very tough issue. And I think we should not underestimate the toughness of the way ahead. COVID has told us that we have had the most incredible disruption, but that we have found a way, some, some way of being able to work around it. And now the question becomes, how do we make sure that we can also deal with the next global catastrophe, which is around the corner, climate change? It is real. It is impacting our lives today, the poorest, are the victims of climate change. It is happening. So the costs are being paid. And we will pay increasingly higher costs, as Mr. Godrich in his you know, very powerful uh, poem put out, that we will pay a higher cost as the, um, as the years go by. So here is an option. Massive green stimulus that is needed. Massive stimulus that is coming in. Some countries, we are putting in 10%, countries putting in 20% of their GDP in a green stimulus. Here is the opportunity. And you've heard some fascinating ideas. None of these mean that we don't have growth. All of them mean that we have growth. But we have growth, which is far more inclusive. Today, we have energy, but we don't have light in the houses of a large number of people. Women still cook using dirty biomass fuel. So we need affordable energy systems which are clean and which are green. And I think that's really the option, the challenge, the opportunity we have. Rebuilding rural India, rethinking urban labor, manufacturing, if nothing, if this disruption does not make us change, nothing in the world will. And I think that's really where the option for the future is. So thank you, Shloka, for giving us all this op opportunity to have this conversation back to you. Thank you, Sunita. And you know, speaking of um, sort of ideas for the future, we actually had a suggestion come in from Usha Thorat, who said, why not push for more allocation for NREGA for environmentally sustainable projects like watershed management, water recycling and building rural infrastructure for health and education using local communities. So we're flush with ideas. I think everyone is sort of reflecting and thinking about how best to move forward given the current crisis and where there might be space for green growth and recovery. So again, thank you so much to our panelists for tonight's discussion. While they come from different sectors and have presented a variety of perspectives, what they do agree on is that it's anything but the time to do away with climate action. In fact, green is the color of the future. It's been a huge week for web webinars and other digital content. So we're very grateful to have you tuning in and staying with us. This is a signal to us that even though there's webinar fatigue, the conversation is most certainly critical. And so we at the ICC are quite keen to continue this discussion and to potentially ensure a reflection of the same into the mainstream political discourse. It feels difficult to have a conversation about green at a time when people are going through economic hardships. This discomfort, however, comes from a long perpetuated false binary, which our, which our panel has addressed tonight, that climate and development goals are different. The truth is that climate action calls for efficient, equitable, clean, and sustainable processes that mitigate economic and social risks. And so when we deprioritize our climate goals under the guise of economic hardship, we only export these risks to the near future. And one more destabilizing global crisis at this scale is something this planet cannot afford. This series will continue with the final installment coming soon. We have a fireside chat with a couple of surprise guests. So you're gonna wanna see this one. Please look out for our email invites as well as of course on the ICC social media. Thank you again to all our panelists. Thank you all for joining us on a Saturday evening. 
stay safe stay well we'll see you very very soon